message is one of the Times Square pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing to World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 214-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to your friends. The first chapter of Joel, I'm going to read two verses, one from the first chapter, one from the second, and I want you to mark them, underline. I think everybody that loves Jesus should have these two verses underlined in your Bible. You should read them every day. You ever open your Bible and say, where shall I start? Start with Joel. Start with these two verses and then go anywhere in the Bible, but uh, say, devil, don't ever try to lie to me anymore because here it is in black and white. Joel, first chapter. This is what you were at one time. Chapter 1, verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. All right, go over to chapter 2. Verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Hallelujah. I will restore to you all the years that the worms have eaten. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, come mightily upon me right now that we may hear and understand what you're saying to us tonight. We give you glory and honor and praise. Lord, I stand here now in your authority, under your unction and your umbrella of anointing, and I stand against every demonic spirit, every evil spirit, everything of hell and Satan, and we bind it so the word of the Lord can get through to hearts. We, we stand against every lie of Satan, and we stand here tonight saying we claim the liberty of the Holy Ghost. We claim the restoring power of Jesus Christ. Lord, there's restoration tonight. There is healing tonight. There's everything we need in Jesus. Lord, set us free to preach it. Set us free to hear it. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may go down just a little bit with these monitors. Thank you. How many of you have wasted years? Anybody here wasted any years? How many would like to have some of them back so you can relive them for Jesus? You see... The closer you get to the Lord, the more you begin to regret all those wasted years. Because there's something in your heart that says, Oh, Jesus, if I had known you, I love you so much. Now, your word is so precious to me. And the body of Jesus is so precious and all these friends that I've learned to love. But, oh, Jesus, how much further I could have been with you. How much revelation of Christ I have missed. How much time I've wasted. How many friends... Have I hurt? How much? How many of my family have I grieved and upset? Lord, if I'd only known you all that time, if I'd only had not fallen, if I'd not been given into this thing that overwhelmed me. Lord, all those wasted years. I know there are some of you sitting here tonight that, that, that think may, you may have one year, two years, but some of you have many, many years. You look back. They're gone. They're wasted. You'd love to have them back. And you're trying to say in your heart, Oh, God, I can't make them up to you. I've lost them. And there's a loss. There's a hurt there deep inside. Now, you know that God's forgiven you. You know that it's all under the blood. But you say, Oh, God, how, how I have hurt you. How I've grieved you over those wasted years. Now, Paul the Apostle could say, just before he died, looking back over his life, he said, oh, God, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He said, there's waiting for me a crown of righteousness. And I was reading that the other day. In fact, I, I have had uh, a knife of the Holy Ghost in my heart for about three weeks on this. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. He's looking back over his life. I've kept the faith. He's speaking to the Lord. He said, I know what waits me. There's a crown of righteousness. And I got to thinking about that. And I said, oh, God, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, perhaps the first 10 years of my ministry and perhaps the last 10, 15 years, 
of my ministry, which represent probably 30 years of my 40-year ministry, but there's a, a little uh, gap in there where I don't think I can say I fought a good fight or that I truly kept the faith. It's not that I had backslidden. I loved the Lord. I was preaching all that time. But you see, I had become very popular around the world with the cross and switchblade, traveling in biggest churches and conventions and preaching up to 50,000 people in overseas meetings and wined and by, dined by uh, world leaders and presidents and preaching in state congresses all over the world. And uh, uh, I'd written a number of books later and the income. I didn't take any income from much from ministry, but from the sale of my books in bookstores. And so I wound up collecting Mercedes automobiles, antiques, and built a house with an indoor swimming pool and, and was living off the fat of the land. And that kind of thing is very dangerous because it sedates you. And the world begins to creep in. Now, I was not living in some kind of flaunted sin. But my, my, the fire was gone, and there was a drifting in my heart, and I, my wife recognized it because at the same time she was going through many cancer operations, six in, in, in particular, six various cancer operations in that particular uh, same time span. And I know looking back, I didn't have the patience, I reacted wrong, and I look back and I, I think of those years and I, I think of them as waste. I think, oh God, there have been many times, where would I be now in you? What kind of revelation? I'm not talking about how, more, how popular I would be or how accepted by the church of the world. But Lord, I feel that I missed something there in my growth. There's something there that I missed and I feel that hurt and I feel that, that I had to go to my wife this past year even as God keeps uh, moving on me and I feel his growth and the word that's coming forth from my fellow pastors here and how I'm growing under that and I, often I've been driven to tears and I've gone to Gwen and said honey those years that I was not patient with you I was not as understanding as a man of God should be I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and I feel that and she knows if you ask my wife now what has been last in the last 10 years she'll say it's been wonderful and, and I can tell you now, I can look my wife in the face and say it's been good. I, I have been, not perfect, but I've been that understanding husband as best of my ability. I'm not perfect and I'm still working on it. But what hurts are those years that I was not understanding, that I hurt her by not being patient and loving and reacting like I did. Some of you know what I'm talking about. There was a period in your marriage or your past, you hurt your wife, you hurt your husband. You hurt others, you hurt friends, you hurt those around you. Most of all, you hurt Jesus. And you know it very deeply and their pain is there. Now, I, I look back and I think of all of that pain and that waste. And many of you here right now, you, you look back with some shame. I'm thinking now of a businessman who attends his church and I think he's here tonight. And uh, we went out to eat. And he's been very successful. And but there was a period in his life uh, a number of years ago that he got discouraged. I don't know what the whole, I don't remember the whole, all the details, but he uh, had problems in his marriage and he got in with the wrong crowd and he started taking drugs. And he got messed up on that and he felt the pressure of this and he walked out on his wife for a period of five or six months and he was on the verge of losing everything. Well now, that's the canker worm that moved in, the palmer worm. Now, please don't look at any significance to all those worms, what their meanings are, the canker worm, the palmer worm, the lungs. The wor a worm is a worm. It eats. It's something that eats you up. And this brother was eaten with canker worms. And now he's serving the Lord with all his heart, really growing in the Lord. He's a lovely man of God. And we went out to eat and he looked at his wife and in so many words he was saying, I don't know if I can make up to her all the years that I heard her. I don't think I can make it up. And he's wanting so much to make it up to her. She's not asking him to make it up because God has made it up to her in a wonderful, wonderful way. But the truth is, uh, you can't make it up to God. You can't possibly make it up to God, and that's what my message is going to reveal tonight. Now, I don't care if you've been saved three weeks, three hours, or 30 years. God says, I will restore to you the years that the worms have eaten. Now, the prophecy of Joel is... Three parts. It's directed at three different parties. First of all, the prophecy of Joel is directed to natural Israel. 
Secondly, it's directed to the church of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, to all individuals within that body. I want to take that third classification individually because the truth of Joel is really a personal testimony. I don't think I, I can read Joel without applying it to myself. Yes, it speaks to Israel, it speaks to the church, all oh, but it speaks to me. And how it speaks to sinners, how it speaks to what you and I once were. Now, I, I was never a drug addict, but I wasted time. But to everyone here that's had a wasted past, I want you to hear what the Spirit's saying, please. Now, Joel perfectly describes what your life was like before you repented. Boy, does he lay it down. He said, you were being devoured by an army of evil spirits. Now, the second chapter of Joel has been totally misinterpreted in many circles in the church today. God's army. Uh, you, you, uh, what's the name of that song they, they, they sing about? The Blow the trumpet in Zion, I believe it is. And many of them are, are, are trying to suggest that this army in Joel 2 is God's army. It is God's army, but it's an army of devouring locusts. It's not some righteous army of Christians or believers, not at all. Let me, let me show, you, uh, show you what I'm talking about. People say, well, it's, it's the Lord's army. The Bible says the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. His camp is very great. He's strong to execute his word. Yes, it's his army, but it's his army that's executing the righteousness. It's an execution army, executing his righteousness and his judgment on an unrepentant people. Now, keep, keep in mind God's uh, program all through the Old Testament and even, even the New. Remember, Cyrus was a heathen king, but God wanted to use him, and he stirred up the heart of Cyrus, the Scripture says, and God said to Cyrus, Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now, he's a heathen king. He's not converted. He's a heathen, idol-worshiping king. And yet God says, Cyrus is my shepherd. He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure. I'm going to put my spirit on him and make him do my will. I'm going to use this heathen king to bring Israel into my divine, eternal purpose. God said of David... I'm going to build you a sure house. But he, then he warned, he said, if any of your sons, if your children disobey me and commit iniquity, I will chasten them with the rod of men. I'll take wicked men, there'll be a rod in my hand, and I'll chastise them. God said of the Assyrians, they are the rod of my anger. I will send against you a profane nation to tread you down like mire in the streets. He said, I'll take that wicked heathen nation of Assyria, and they will become my army. It's my army because I am commanding them to execute my righteous judgments. Now, we, we see this in, in Joel 2, this army. It's a picture of an unrepentant people. It's a picture of you and every sinner before you repented. It's an army. The walls came down. You had, the Bible says they're going to come over the walls, they're going to come in the windows. You'll have no defense against them, nothing can stand in the way. They're under a special government, they won't break ranks because they're under a demonic king. And they will not break rank because they're under a government. A very clear, demanding government. Sound an alarm in Zion. What's an alarm? The enemy is coming, there's an enemy army. It doesn't say, blow the trumpet uh, in gladness because the righteous army. No, warn Zion. Blow a trumpet in Zion because this wicked army of locusts is coming. And canker worms. There's an army of worms. They're going to come through and everything is green. Everything is good. Everything is righteous. They're going to eat everything in sight and leave it withered. Everywhere they go, there's nothing but desolation and withering. A loss of joy. These are evil locusts. Now... Think back at your past. What happened to you? The army came and invaded you. What else? Every vial of crack is a locust. It's a palmer worm. It's a canker worm that eats and destroys. Every needle, every glass seen bag of coker heroin, these are locusts. Every pornographic magazine, every dirty movie, these are the locusts of the army of the devil that came in right now. There's a young baseball player from the Mets. 
being eaten with locusts. His name is Daryl Strawberry. He's just checked himself into hospital here for alcoholism. Richard Pryor, a comedian. His, his garden's being eaten up, absolutely devoured. He almost blew himself up, free basing cocaine, blew up in his face. In fact, he later said he, he poured gasoline on himself and later trying to commit suicide. But now he's back on crack. And he said recently, he said, if I don't kick this, I'm a dead man. He said, all hope is gone. What is it? It's this army of locusts. It's withering, eating away. The mayor of Washington, D.C., Barry, checked into a hospital now. The, the, the mayor of the capital city of the United States of America, eaten with worms. The canker worm eating, he says, has been there for 15 years. Eating, eating away, destroying. There's some of you sitting here right now, you got a worm eating at you. Crack. Some of you, I know, God made it clear, there are three or four here that were on crack, you were on drugs, and you had a victory, but right now, you've had one or two slips in the past week or two, and right now, that worm is back at work in you, and God wants to deliver you tonight. God wants to set you free in this service, and put the fear of God in you, and say, if you don't deal with it now, let the Holy Ghost come in, and deal with it, and restore you, it's going to wipe you out. You're going to eat everything, you lose your family, you're going to lose everything in the process. Locusts have devoured everything, this satanic worm. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm left, the caterpillar has eaten. You look at chapter 1, verse 6, and you'll see the devil at work. You'll see his teeth marks right there on chapter 6, er, verse 6. Nation come up, uh, that nation is people. For a people has come up upon my land strong, without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he that, and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Who is the lion that destroys? Satan himself. And some of you that are sitting here right now, you've had the teeth marks of the devil himself. He bit into you, and he clamped his jaw on you, and held you in his power. And every locust of hell, every canker worm of hell came and ate everything that was decent. Your family was gone. Your job, your decency, your memory, your mind, your spirit, everything. The devil ate it. These locusts moved in and destroyed everything in sight. Verse 10, it says, it left nothing but waste. The field is wasted. That was you. The land more than for corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up and the oil languished. It's all a picture. Look at verse 12. The vine is dried up. The fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Now, everything in my life, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. You say, well, that's stretching it, trying to individualize it. No, I'll tell you what, this whole book is an individual book. It's directed to the heart. It's for every one of us. That's not stretching the prophetic word at all. God is applying. He said, it's written for us upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, doesn't that pretty well describe where you were? Isn't that why you wasted years? You made all kinds of promises. You tried to fight. You tried to resist, but there was no fighting this enemy. The vine was dried, the fig tree wilted, and all the trees were withered in joy, passed away. What a terrible picture is being painted by the prophet. And that's the picture of the sin. That's a picture of you. I think of Teen Challenge up here, all the fellows from drugs. What else is it when you walk in the street? What else is it when you've lost everything? But the very thing that Joel's talking about. Some of you didn't walk the street. You may even be able to go to the job. But you were lost. You were absolutely lost. You were in despair. If you hadn't lost your marriage, you were on the verge of losing it. There was despair. There was emptiness. You were absolutely eaten up and destroyed. But thank God... Joel prophesies the full restoration of those who truly repent. Absolute total restoration. I will restore to you the years the canker worm hath eaten. Now, the New American Standard reads, I will make up to you the years eaten and stripped. I'll make up to you all the years. Now, that's incredible. I used to think, Lord, those... Remember those years that I wasted? 
Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to double up my prayer life. I'm going to read more. I'm going to study more. I'm going to love you more. I'm going to make it all up to you. And Lord said, wrong. You can't make up a single day. You can't make up. I will make it up to you. I will make up to you the years the canker worm and the palmer worm is eaten. I'll make up to you. I'll make it up to you. I'll restore it to you. That's what it, is that what it says in your Bible? I'll restore to you. Now put your seatbelt on and exercise your faith. And let's get a hold of something from God right now because I, I went out of the service back there and the Lord made me a promise. Even while I'm preaching, going to bring up faith in your heart and set a lot of people free right now. I want to believe the Lord with you right now in this service for a total restoration of your spirit and life. Now, look at 221. When you repent, here's where it begins. Did you repent? I said, did you repent? Do you love him with all your heart? All right, can, will you believe with me now what he says? Verse 21, fear not, O land, or people. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do what? The Lord will do great things. Now, what great thing do you want him to do? I know what I want. I want to claim that promise that he'll restore all the years. Let me, let me go on with you. Try to show you what's in my heart. Verse 20. Read, read, read verse 20. He's going to remove that army away from you, first of all. 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army, those locusts and canker worms. And I'll drive them into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. He tried to do a great thing against you and destroy a God. So I'm going to drive your enemy. I'm going to get all those worms and I'm going to push them into the sea and drown them. And the stink will come up to the high heaven. I'm going to take that devil out of you. I'm going to take that spirit that's been hounding you. I'm going to take that tempter. And I'm going to drive that army away. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm, that's a great thing to have that army driven away. The Lord says, then I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to fill your soul with, with blessings. Revelation of Jesus. Look at verse chapter 2, 26. And ye shall eat in plenty. You'll be what? I didn't hear you. <laughs> Are you satisfied with Jesus? Yes. He said, uh, you're going to eat in plenty? Well, we ate, we ate plenty this morning, didn't we? God just poured it on. He filled the plate. You'll be satisfied and you'll praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Not of your past. Not of your past. You will not be ashamed anymore. I'm going to tell you why. You won't be ashamed in just a moment. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else And my people shall never be ashamed. Now look this way for just a moment. You and I were born for an eternal purpose. Let me try to make it just as simple as the Lord's given it to me. We were born with an eternal purpose in mind. All things were created by Him and for Him. You and I were created for Jesus, for His glory, His fellowship, and His blessing. Now, somewhere along the line, that eternal purpose for your life to bring joy to Jesus and to be the joy of his heart got messed up. Somewhere along the line, through rebellion, through sin, the enemy came in, the locust army came in, began to consume everything in sight and left you withered and wasted. And I don't know how it happened, but the Lord, not through any goodness of yours or mine, he sent the Holy Ghost and he convicted you and he called you. And he changed you. And he brought you to a place of repentance. And he did great things for you. And he began to satisfy your soul. And I'll tell you what he does. He brings you back to his eternal plan and purpose. He had a plan for you. You say, well, I wasted so many years of that plan. But I'm going to tell you what God does. It's just like a great big long string. And there's a little piece there. of You, you, you cut it out. And there's this big gap between what you left God's eternal purpose and his plan for your life. And then you wasted all this time. You came over here and you repented. And there's this big gap. And you know what the Lord does? He takes those two gaps and he puts them together just like that. And he removes all those years inside. He restores it. You can't even find out where the crack is anymore. 
I've been told that when a piece of steel breaks and you weld it together, it's stronger at the weld than any other place. And when God restores, he does it good. Remember when Jesus was in the temple and the man came with a withered hand? The scripture says, and Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And the Bible said, and he restored his hand just like the other. So he looks at it. And you can't tell which hand, which hand was withered, this one or this one. You can't tell. He has to tell you. And the Lord restores you. He restores you. Let me tell you what he does, the way he restores you. And it's, this, this, this so blessed my heart, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to let you see it. The way he restored Israel. Remember, Israel had sinned, and God's eternal plan and purpose was broken for Israel. Famine came. Wild beasts ate everything in sight, began to devour the people. All the wells dried up, the vineyards dried up, the grapes dried up, everything was dry and dead. And there was no water, there was no hope, and God came to that, into that hopeless scene, and he said, I will restore. And all those years of harvest, they lost years of harvest. There was no harvest in Israel whatsoever. And the Lord came with this promise, I will restore to you. All the years, now up to this time, if there had been any harvest, the locust came in, every, everything in sight. Year after year, the locust came, the palmer worm, everything. Even the seed was rotten under the clods. There was nothing. And the Lord said, I'm going to restore all those years. You know what he did? He restored it this way. When they repented, when they came back to him and obeyed his voice, he supernaturally caused harvest that were above the ability of nature itself to produce. So that the harvest after repentance made up for all those years. The Lord said, you lived in shame, I will repay you double. You've repented, I'll repay you double. Remember in the scripture in the Old Testament, and here's God's eternal, uh, marvelous law of the harvest. When you repent, repentance is a powerful, powerful thing. What it, what it causes to be released in our body, the restoring power that's released when you truly repent. In the Old Testament, they were told that you plant six years. The seventh year is to be a rest unto the Lord. He said, you'll not plant seed. You will not even prune your vineyard. The sixth year belongs to the Lord. It's a rest. And he said, then if you ask, then how shall we eat? Because we have not planted for this year. We've not planned. And you know what he said? God made them a promise. The sixth year, I'll give you a triple harvest. That triple harvest will take care of year seven and year eight and year nine. Six, seven, and eight. Rather, it'll take right up to the ninth year. So I'm going to cause, God said, I will command the earth to bring forth a triple harvest. All right. You repent. You say, oh, Lord, I've missed all those years. No, when you repent... Something happens supernaturally. God commands a harvest in your mind, in your spirit. And he brings forth a triple revelation of who he is. And he comes down on you. He can do it in six months. He can do it in a year. So that when you suddenly stand before the throne of Jesus, you're right here on this earth. You're in this church. But God said, I will restore to you all those wasted years. I bring you right now because of repentance where you would be if you hadn't sinned. I bring you right where you have been. You haven't lost anything if you repented and walked with me. I've restored it all. Everything you would have had if you had never sinned. Everything if you had never turned your back on me. I fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you sitting here, you're going to look back with dread and horror at your past sin. But then you're to forget it. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ. Forget the past. God said, I'm not holding it against you. You said, well, if I hadn't sinned right now, I'd have known Jesus better. Or if you repented, you haven't lost anything. He's going to give you triple portion. He said, I'll pour it on you. You can know him better than you've ever known him. You can have all the revelation you want. He said, I'll command the harvest for you. Glory to God. I, I can take you to I can take you to Pentecostal churches and show you a thousand people in some of these churches, two thousand sitting there dead and dry, not growing. They haven't been out in drugs. They don't have that gap that they've wasted. 
They're not wasting a gap. They're just floating right through life without digging in or anything else. And here come sinners, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, having wasted years, and God lets them walk right by. They learn more. They see more. They enjoy the Lord more. This is the end of side one. You may now turn the tape over to side two.
Why? Because the Lord of the harvest has restored all the years the canker worm has eaten. Glory be to God. That's why it's such a joy pastoring this church. We've got a lot of people that have come through the worm fields. I mean, they've been withered and dry and empty, and now they love Him. He that's forgiven much loveth much. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He restores all the years that the canker worm has eaten. Hallelujah. Uh, Psalms, or, or, or go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, please. Believe it or not, I'm almost finished. I didn't come here to preach a long sermon, and I just, God just said, put this on the heart. By the way, he said, your floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. God said, I'm going to fill your heart. Hallelujah. You've repented. I'm going to give you harvest that you don't know what to do. And that's what he go He's been doing that in this church. He's filling every seat uh, in this house. One day, you're going to have to walk in here and come an hour early to get a seat. Because the floor is full, and the vat's going to be overflowing with oil and wine. Because we have a repentant people. Hallelujah. Chapter, Isaiah 61. Look at verse 3. He said, I've come to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Boy, what a harvest. Hallelujah. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Verse 7. For your shame, you shall have what? Double portion. For confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be upon them. Look at verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he's clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud. And as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. God said, I'll make it spring up in you. Hallelujah. I'm going to close in just a minute, but I, last night I was preaching up in uh, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, to about 450 drug addicts at a, at a uh, banquet. I hate banquets, but uh, I enjoyed this one. Because they were all, I mean, saved out of sin. I, there must have been 10,000 wasted years among them. I mean, it's something. And one of the directors of one of the programs got up and testified. And uh, he'd been saved from drugs and uh, married, happily married. He went out, became a businessman, and got cold and indifferent and backslid. Went back to drugs. Lost his wife and daughter and spent seven years wandering, going down to the depths of sin. He didn't know what I was going to preach. And I, I noticed his wife was uh, leading the choir, very lovely young lady. And he got up. He, he said, uh, I lost everything, totally destroyed. My wife was gone. And uh, she had thought of getting remarried, but somehow God stepped in each time and stopped it. And uh, he came back to the Lord two years ago. And a year later, the Lord restored his wife, restored his daughter, and the whole family's been restored. He said, I've never been so happy. They're so happy in the Lord. Six years separated, God restored it. Beloved, you know what this whole thing is about? It's about life. When you give everything to Jesus, he brings his life. And life produces life. Everything you touch comes alive. Hallelujah. That's the joy of what Bob was speaking about this morning. Just get your heart full of Jesus. Love Him with all your heart and obey His Word. Obey His every command and say, Lord, I'm at your command. And as you do, as you walk before Him humbly, there's a life that comes out of you. It produces life. And everything, where there was death before, everything was dying. Your marriage was dying. Everything around. Beloved, the sure sign that you walk with Jesus is that things are coming to life. Things are springing up. He's bringing hope to you. He's bringing faith to you. You begin to believe God for the salvation of your family because the life of Jesus is in you. The restoring life of Jesus. And I believe in the impartation of his life.
I believe he imparts it to the repentant soul, and you and I can impart that by faith. Uh, Brother Raul, the director of the program, stood before the people and he, he, when his young son was going through a battle years ago in one of my meetings. I laid hands on him and prophesied over him. And he said there was something imparted to that young man, and that young man serving God with all his heart today. There was a spirit of life producing life. And you've got to sit here tonight and believe that when Jesus abides in you, it is a spirit of life. It's a restoring power. It's a restoring power. Restores you. Restores everything in you. And he promised to restore everything that canker worm has eaten. He'll restore your wife. He'll restore your husband. He can restore your children. Restore your family. Hold on to God and believe him for that. And don't ask for anything short. A full restoration of everything that touches your life. Hallelujah. God's restoring. I want you to stand, please. <laughs> now, that's the shortest message I've ever preached in this church. <laughs> but I tell you what, God just told me to say it and then to pray for a miracle. And I'm believing God to restore. God promised me He's going to restore. If you're here tonight and you've been wavering and the enemy's coming against you and you see that locust army approaching you again, you stand up tonight and say, God's promised to drive that army into the sea. He's promised to drive it into the sea. If you need restoration and healing, God can restore you tonight. Maybe you walked in here tonight. Maybe it's your first time here. He wants to restore you and he wants to restore everything around you. He wants to totally Give back to you everything that's wasted. Hallelujah. You know something? I can stand here right now, and I tell it to you honestly. I, since God put this in my heart, by grace, I don't ever have to again say, Lord, I'm going to make up those years to you. But I know one thing. He's made it up. My wife and I talked about it two nights ago. We, we just talked. God, we were talking about all our grandchildren, about the family here that God has brought together, and all the people we work with. And, and I, I looked at her and said, honey, can you believe it, what God has done? Can you believe the, the glorious, marvelous healing power? God's healed you. He's kept our family. He's blessed in such a wonderful way. And she said, honey, if, if it was only this past six months, this past two years, he's made up for all the years. He's made up and more. Hasn't God made up to you all the years? He's made them up to you. Hallelujah. And it's only the beginning. Hallelujah. There's great joy, victory, restoration in His name. Hallelujah. Lord, restore tonight. Restore and heal. Restore and heal. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, Lord Jesus, there are people standing here that are still wasting their years. They're caught. There's some here right now being eaten with worms, of sin, lust or habits, or, or fear, depression, degradation of some kind. Oh, Jesus, that, that locust army, that canker worm army is eating away at their spirit and body, soul and mind. Lord, deliver and restore tonight. Others, Lord, the devil's trying to tell them that they're, they're not going to make it, that they're addiction prone. Or there's something basically wrong with their character. And the past has been brought up and they're harassed by their past. God, help them to take a step of faith and say, I forget my past and I'm going to move on in Jesus tonight. I forget my past. The Lord has restored me from my past. He's made it up to me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Beloved, you don't have to make anything up to God. You come by grace. And that's the miracle of grace that... He, when we should do everything to try to make it up to him, he says, no. I want your heart. You give me your heart. I'm going to make it up to you. When he, when he had every right to damn us to hell and say, you failed me, depart from me, your work of iniquity. He stretched out his hand. He chased away the locust. And he says, now come, I'm going to restore everything to you. That the worms have eaten, I'm going to restore it to you. Hallelujah. If you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit up in the balcony... Here on the main floor, just come and stand here right now and say, I need that restoring power tonight. I need restoration. 
I want God to restore my life, my home, whatever it may be. And if you need that restoration power tonight, up in the balcony, come down any step and down any stairs, any aisle here. The Lord bless you. As you sing, come. You can still come while we're while I'm talking. That's it. Come as the Spirit draws you. Hallelujah. Some of you here tonight need a, a miracle from the Lord. But let me read it again. We are singing, Only Believe. Now I will restore to you the years the canker worm hath eaten. That cancer. That cancer of sin. He said, I'll destroy the enemy. If you'll truly repent, I'll break the power of sin in your life. And I'll restore to you. I'll restore to you. Hallelujah. That's the miracle. You that are up here, look at me, please. In every service that we're here, all the pastors, we look down at you while you're standing here. We, some of you, we, we see tears. and we, we can't read your mind. But all in our hearts, we racing in prayer and said, Oh, Jesus, answer prayer. Change lives. Heal. Heal the minds and the hurts. And Break the power of sin and establish the people in your faith. Establish people. Restore and heal. I don't know how he does it. I can't begin to know how he does it. But I have faith tonight. I believe God right now that he'll restore you. He'll restore you. Do you have a marriage that's in trouble? I believe God can restore that marriage. First of all, I'm going to ask God to remove all the fear of your past away because if you're truly repentant. That's just a bugaboo of the enemy. That's just a harassment that you don't have to put up with anymore. You can forget those things that are behind now and press on in Jesus. But first of all, let's lay every sin down, every idol. Raise both hands to the Lord right now, will you please? Raise both hands. Will you pray this out of your heart? Dear Jesus, I feel your spirit calling me tonight to come out of my sin and unbelief. I believe you, Jesus, to heal and restore everything that the worms have eaten. I believe you, I trust you, and I say to my heart and to the whole world, I believe Jesus is alive and he's in my heart to save and to restore. Remove the past. Remove the enemy from my heart and heal me. Now just thank him right now. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you and I give you glory and praise. And thanksgiving for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the tape. 